ranking 10 different versions of Tinkerbell. Fairies have been a staple of myths and fables for hundreds of years now, being as prevalent a mythical creature as elves or mermaids, but there's perhaps no better known fairy in the modern era than Tinkerbell. Originally appearing in J.M. Barrie's 1904 play Peter Pan and its 1911 novelization Peter and Wendy, Tinkerbell is a common tinker fairy, someone who repairs pots and pans. The loyal companion of the eternal child, Peter Pan, Tinkerbell secretly harbors a one-sided crush on him, and as a result can be jealous and vindictive towards others that she feels are coming between her and Peter, namely Wendy Darling, a human girl living in London who Peter meets after losing his shadow. Because the story of Peter Pan was so popular upon its release, it eventually made its way to Hollywood, first being adapted in 1924 as a silent film. In the near 100 years since, the story has been retold over a dozen times, some as loose reimaginings and others as faithful interpretations. Despite initially being nothing more than a voiceless supporting character that was depicted by a light on stage, Tinkerbell has grown increasingly popular over the years, to the extent that she's even appeared in projects that have no mention of Peter Pan. Good for her. With so many iterations of the magical character appearing over the years, in today's video we've decided to take a look at 10 different versions of Tinkerbell in film and TV, then we'll rank them based on their role in the story, appearance, and personality. Just as a disclaimer, this is a ranking of the character, not the project, because trust me when I say that the best Tinkerbells usually aren't in the best movies. And for the sake of my sanity, I won't be able to include every single iteration of the character. She's also so recognizable at this point that she's been referenced and parodied on countless occasions, but those depictions won't count in this video considering they're not actually a new interpretation of Tinkerbell. They're just a joke. And because it must be said, this is my opinion. And it's totally fine if you disagree, just don't be an asshole about it. Now that that's out of the way, let's get into it. In Barry's play, Peter invites Wendy and her brothers to Neverland, a place where children never have to grow up. And using Tinkerbell's fairy dust, they fly off on a grand adventure. As they near Neverland, Tinkerbell tricks one of the Lost Boys into shooting Wendy down from the sky, but she manages to survive, much to Tink's disappointment. As Wendy recovers, her brothers bond with the Lost Boys, and all three of the darling siblings begin to forget their parents and home. Meanwhile, Peter is constantly battling a group of wicked pirates, who are led by Captain Hook, who seeks revenge on Peter for cutting off his hand and feeding it to a crocodile. As time passes, Wendy begins to fall in love with Peter, but he sees her as nothing more than the mother he never had, leading to misunderstandings between the two. Wendy is eventually able to remember her real life and insists that the darlings return to London, but they're captured by Captain Hook while Peter is asleep. When he awakens, Tinkerbell informs him of the darlings' capture and warns Peter against drinking his medicine, which was poisoned by Hook. Peter ignores her, and in order to save him, she drinks the poison and sacrifices herself, only surviving through the power of children's belief in fairies. Peter goes to fight Captain Hook, easily winning, and returns Wendy to the real world, but not before promising to bring her back to Neverland every spring. The story jumps forward a year, with Tinkerbell having died because fairies have naturally short lifespans. Depressingly, Peter has already forgotten all about her as well as their adventures. He's just the worst. Walt Disney had first sought to adapt the story of Peter Pan back in the 1930s, hoping to make it his second full-length animated feature following 1937's Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. After jumping through several hoops, the company was finally able to acquire the rights to the story, but struggled with the film's direction, going back and forth between a faithful adaptation of the original play or exploring Peter's origin story. The project remained in development until 1941, but following the United States' entry into World War II, it was put on pause, as Disney was commissioned to create war propaganda films instead. It wasn't until 1949 that the film was finally placed back into production, with Disney settling on a simplified retelling of the stage production that was also inspired by the 1924 silent film. Several scenes wound up being cut for time or being altered to better suit the film's cheerier tone, and as a result the film and the play are actually significantly different. This led to a good deal of criticism upon the film's release, especially in the UK, with reviewers claiming that it lacked the spirit and charm of the original work. Other criticisms were directed towards the film's American approach to the characters, specifically Peter. However, there was one aspect that was universally praised, Tinkerbell. Although the story of Peter Pan had remained popular in the years since its release, Tinkerbell was hardly a beloved character in the 1950s. 
but that all changed because of Disney's movie. Evolving from a ball of light that flits around the stage to an actual character, the film was able to use her humanoid appearance to their benefit. So even though she didn't speak, she was able to express a wide range of emotions from sorrow to guilt to spite. According to J.M. Barry, Tinkerbell's hot and cold personality is because of her size, as she's so small that she's unable to process more than one feeling at a time. Many are quick to call Disney's version of Tinkerbell mean, in large part because of her treatment of Wendy, but I'd argue that much like Peter, she's just a child with no emotional intelligence, regardless of her mature appearance. In fact, Walt Disney even stated that his two daughters, Sharon and Diane, served as the inspiration for the character's personality. I think if they'd kept the poison scene from the play instead of replacing it with a bomb, she probably wouldn't be remembered as being so vicious, as it would have provided a more heartfelt moment to fully redeem her character. Not to mention that by having Tinkerbell reveal Peter's hideout to Captain Hook, something Disney added to the story, she doesn't really come across in the best light. Although Tinkerbell's feelings for Peter are often cited as the reasons for her dislike of Wendy, Margaret Carey, who served as the live-action reference for the character, said, quote, Tinkerbell was not in love with Peter. I played Tinkerbell to be a young girl of about 10. She was jealous of Wendy because she thought Wendy was going to get to go on her adventures, not because she was in love with Peter. In spite of her prickly personality, the little pixie quickly became the most popular character in the film, not only amongst children, but adults as well. Although that wasn't exactly for the purest of reasons. While her loyalty to Peter and humorous temper tantrums were commended by critics, most of the attention was directed towards her appearance, with the character even being described as provocative. Many film critics from the time period cited Marilyn Monroe as the source of inspiration for Tinkerbell, comparing their sex appeal and shapely figure. Because of this popularity, and Walt Disney's personal fondness for the character, Tinkerbell soon became the company's unofficial mascot, appearing in advertisements and being a live performer at the parks, and she was so widely recognized during that era that only Mickey Mouse could compete with her. During Disney's direct-to-video era, Tinkerbell made an official on-screen return in 2002's Return to Neverland, a sequel to Disney's 1953 film. Taking place several years after the events of the first film, Wendy's daughter, Jane, is the one who winds up in Neverland and is at the receiving end of Tinkerbell's hot temper. The idea for the movie was taken from an epilogue written by Barry four years after the original production of Peter Pan, which showed Wendy all grown up with a daughter of her own. Unlike her mother, Jane doesn't take Tinkerbell's abuse lying down, and snaps back, declaring that she doesn't believe in fairies, which causes Tinkerbell to lose her strength and her light begins to fade. After she accidentally betrays Peter to the pirates, Jane realizes her mistake and tries to save Tinkerbell before it's too late, and with Jane's newfound faith, Tink is revived. Tink uses her pixie dust to teach Jane how to fly, and together they help save Peter and the Lost Boys. After returning Jane to London, Tinkerbell and Wendy reunite, having a reconciliation of sorts, which I appreciate since it really shows the growth of her character. I mentioned this in my ranking of Disney's direct-to-video sequels, but Jane is a pretty unlikable protagonist, and as a result, even when Tinkerbell bullies her, it doesn't feel as cruel as when she did it to Wendy. Also, instead of Tink's anger seeming to stem from jealousy as it did in the previous film, now it's more out of annoyance and anxiety, which makes her actions feel more reasonable. This more sympathetic direction was no doubt the result of Tinkerbell's popularity over the last 50 years, with Disney likely wanting to address the jokes about their mascot being a bitch. You'll also notice that despite having the same appearance as she did previously, the character's actions aren't as sexualized, no longer getting stuck in a keyhole or checking herself out in a mirror, which once again alludes to Disney's attempt to rebrand the character as more family-friendly. Although Disney's 1953 take on Peter Pan had proven successful, very few attempts were made to adapt the story again for several years. Finally, in 1989, the Japanese animation studio, Nippon Animation, released the adventures of Peter Pan as part of their popular World Masterpiece Theater series. Beginning in 1969, each year the series would cover a different classical book from the West, like Anne of Green Gables, A Little Princess, or The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. Although the first few episodes of The Adventures of Peter Pan followed J.M. Barry's book rather closely, with Peter meeting the darlings and taking them to Neverland, it explored the characters and the setting in further detail as the series progressed, which made sense considering the show consisted of 41 30-minute episodes. In the first half of the series, Hook is constantly scheming against Peter Pan, eventually tricking Tink into betraying the group, resulting in their capture. The second half of the series is where things truly go off the rails. 
Following the battle with Captain Hook, Neverland becomes a wasteland and Tink goes missing, forcing Peter Pan, the Darlings, and the Lost Boys to go in search of her with the help of the Princess of Darkness. Even more fantastical drama occurs during this hunt for Tinkerbell, culminating with Peter and Captain Hook once again entering a grand battle. For the first half of the series, Tinkerbell is more of a schemer and troublemaker, often pulling pranks on those that she knows she can trick, which isn't just limited to the Darlings. She isn't necessarily doing this out of any genuine ill will, but more so as a way of having fun. However, she's also deeply insecure, which results in her occasionally being manipulated herself. In the latter half of the series, she's repentant for her prior behavior, although she refuses to outright apologize. A classic Sundere, at the end of the series she tells the darlings she never wants to see them again before sending them home, although the Lost Boys point out that Tink never says what she actually feels, highlighting how her character is innately afraid of getting hurt, although she does show her love for others by putting her own life at risk on multiple occasions. When in the human world, she almost sounds like an old computer instead of ringing bells, but once the story moves to Neverland, she speaks like any other character. She looks pretty different from Disney's Tinkerbell, sporting a red pixie cut, har har, and a pink dress, and overall she feels kind of toy-like. Two years later came 20th Century Fox's Peter Pan and the Pirates, which as the name suggests, focused on the conflict between Peter and Captain Hook. Although the series featured Barry's iconic characters, it deviated significantly from the original storyline, simply using Neverland as a setting to teach children important moral lessons. There isn't even an explanation as to why the darlings are there. They just are. As always, Tinkerbell is Peter Pan's devoted sidekick, and while her fairy dust still grants the ability of flight, it can also make fire, bring stories to life, and even change the other characters' appearances, making this the most powerful Tinkerbell to date. Voiced by Debbie Derryberry, best known for Jimmy Neutron, I find this Tinkerbell to be more whiny than others, frequently vocalizing her displeasure instead of simply acting on it in the impulsive manner we've come to associate with her. She's a lot more upfront about her attachment to Peter and her negative feelings towards the Darlings. She isn't as big of a prankster as the other iterations, but she still acts thoughtlessly, with these actions often having consequences that dictate the course of the episode. While other Tinkerbells have their funny and even sensitive moments, I find that this Tinkerbell really only has three emotions, anger, jealousy, and sorrow. And as a result, she isn't all that likable, which makes even her more pitiful moments hard to empathize with. Also, despite the show going on for 65 episodes, she has very little growth, remaining hostile towards anyone who isn't Peter throughout the entire series. This Tinkerbell has the most juvenile appearance so far, making her immaturity more realistic. While her color palette is reminiscent of Tinkerbell from the 1989 series, there are several more details including a flower hat, shoes, and butterfly wings, which overall make her feel more woodsy and cute. Directed by Steven Spielberg, the film follows an adult Peter Pan after he's left Neverland and forgotten his childhood, becoming a successful but unimaginative lawyer who is married to Wendy's granddaughter Moira, with whom he has two children. Because he's such a workaholic, his relationship with his family has become strained, but after his children are kidnapped by Captain Hook, Peter is brought back to Neverland by Tinkerbell. Although his arch nemesis is initially disappointed by Peter's inability to fight and his fear of flying, Tinkerbell convinces Hook to give Peter a few days to train before returning for a great battle. Although he initially struggles, Peter is able to use his imagination once again, restoring his memory and abilities. This version of Tinkerbell, played by Julia Roberts, is more than a sassy sidekick and effectively sets the events in the film in motion. Having found Peter when he was just an infant, she was the one who brought him to Neverland, with the two having countless adventures before he left and forgot her to be with Moira, resulting in Tinkerbell taking charge of the rest of the Lost Boys. With Peter being played by a grown man for once, the film is less ambiguous about the nature of Tink's feelings for him, being undeniably romantic, although he still winds up rejecting her in the end. I'll admit that out of all the projects that feature the Tinkerbell has a crush on Peter storyline, this is probably the one that makes me the most uncomfortable, just because she actually raised him. Tink's personality is a huge shift from other iterations of the character, being less moody and volatile and more cheeky and charming. She's still a bit manipulative, but it's done for the greater good as opposed to her own selfish desires, at least most of the time. 
This version of Tinkerbell is spunky while still having her vulnerable moments, and as a result, she feels like one of the most realistic interpretations of the character thus far. Although considering she's supposed to be a mythical creature, I could understand why some might argue against that characterization. While Disney's Tinkerbell was hyper-feminine in appearance and personality, this Tinkerbell is more of a tomboy, effectively being one of the guys, which is why when she finally reveals her feelings to Peter, she dons a more stereotypically feminine appearance under the belief that it will make him see her in a new light and fall in love with her. Originally, Tinkerbell was going to have a blonde pixie cut to allude to Disney's movie, but with Julia Roberts being famously red-haired, this idea was next. Red better. Which I personally think is a shame, considering two prior tanks already had red hair, and one even had a pixie cut. I also don't like the boring brown outfit that they wound up giving her. I get that it's supposed to make her eventual transformation more significant, but I think it's just ugly. They should have just stuck to the sequin set that they first tried out. Although the film is considered a 90s classic, it was poorly received at the time of its release with Steven Spielberg repeatedly saying in recent years that he was disappointed with the final product. Julia Roberts even received a Golden Raspberry nomination for Worst Supporting Actress and was allegedly a nightmare on set, resulting in the nickname Tinker Hell. As someone who personally gets a kick out of the movie, although I can admit it's because of childhood nostalgia, I still think it's worth watching for the Neverland sequences, which are just oodles of fun. If you're around my age, then you were no doubt obsessed with the 2003 adaptation of Peter Pan, and I remember begging my mom to rent it from Blockbuster for several weeks in a row until she finally broke down. Based on the original 1904 play, the film tells the classic story of Peter Pan, but with a contemporary fantasy aesthetic reminiscent of Harry Potter, Pirates of the Caribbean, and The Lord of the Rings. This film's version of Tinkerbell, played by actress Ludovine Sagné, is once again voiceless, now using elaborate charades to get her meaning across. She's violent, emotional, petty, theatrical, and immature, which makes her attachment to Peter come across as less romantic and more like a child who doesn't want their favorite toy taken away, which I think works, even if it makes her rather annoying. I'll be honest, out of all of the versions of Tinkerbell, this is the one I'd be most tempted to swat like a fly. Her appearance is similar to that of Disney's Tinkerbell, with a blonde updo and strapless dress, but she looks a touch more rugged. Unlike Disney's version, this Tinkerbell actually drinks the poison meant for Peter Pan, but because the character doesn't have much screen time prior to that, apart from attacking Wendy and crying about Peter, it once again isn't as heartfelt as it could be. The main reason I wind up feeling for her is because Jeremy Sumter does such an excellent job expressing Peter's anguish over her death. Overall, this Tinkerbell is primarily comic relief, as seen with her over-the-top gesturing, but I do think she captures the vibe of the fickle pixie. I just wish we'd seen a bit more growth over the course of the film. Side note, you know you've gotten old when Captain Hook becomes the movie's eye candy. Now you didn't think I'd forgotten about these, did ya? As we've already mentioned, Tinkerbell was a massive success for Disney, to the point that she even became a member of the newly formed Disney Princess lineup in 2000, but she was soon removed in favor of starring in her own franchise, the Disney Fairies. Although it took inspiration from J.M. Barrie's work in regard to its setting, the Disney Fairies franchise introduced an assortment of new characters and lore to Neverland. I'd be here all day if I went into the nitty gritty details behind the franchise, but let me know if you'd be interested in a video all about it. Although the series included several books as well as an online role-playing game, we're going to be focusing on Tinkerbell's appearances in the six direct-to-video movies that were released between 2008 and 2015. The events in the films take place several years before the 1953 movie and serve as Tinkerbell's origin story, following the character as she's born, discovers her tinker talent, befriends other fairies, and saves Neverland. The series marked the first time that Disney's Tinkerbell actually spoke, with Mae Whitman voicing the now-computer-animated character. Over the course of the series, Tinkerbell receives a handful of new outfits, although her iconic green dress makes the most appearances, with the movies even showing the audience that Tink made it herself. The series highlights most of Tinkerbell's positive traits like her loyalty and bravery, while her more negative traits like her stubbornness and short temper are reframed as simply being part of her passionate nature. Although she still has her fiery moments, she's significantly nicer than her 1953 or 2002 counterparts, to the point that I consider them completely unrelated, hence why they're separated in this ranking. 
A few characters from the original movie appear, including Captain Hook and Wendy, but we never learn how Tinkerbell and Peter Pan first meet, which I find to be rather unfortunate as it could have created a stronger continuity between the Disney Fairies franchise and the original movie, because surely I'm not the only one who needs to know how Tinkerbell got so cranky. This sci-fi miniseries serves as a prequel to the story we know and love, with James Hook being the leader of a group of young thieves in London, which includes Peter Pan. After discovering that Hook and the rest of the boys have been transported to another world, Peter follows them with a magical orb in the hopes of rescuing them. It's revealed that the tree spirits that live in this world make a magical mineral dust that allows you to fly, which a group of pirates Hook has joined up with are in search of. After getting injured, Peter is taken to the secret mineral pond by one of the tree spirits, Tinkerbell, and it heals him. He later bumps into Hook, who tricks Peter into showing him the mineral pond. The tree spirits erase Peter's memory as punishment for betraying their location, and Tinkerbell is also banished for choosing Peter over her own people. They decide to fight Hook once again with the help of the other residents of the world, but Tinkerbell is injured and Peter is unable to escape a collapsing cave, leading the others to believe they've died. They reappear later on, healed, with Peter's shadow missing, foreshadowing the events of the original story. All of the tree spirits have a shiny silver appearance, resulting in the least normal looking Tinkerbell thus far, and while I respect the creativity, I think it makes her look like an alien. Although Charlotte Atkinson acted as her body model, Kira Knightley served as the voice of her thoughts, which can only be heard by other tree spirits and those like Peter who views the magical mineral dust. Her characterization is vastly different from other versions of Tinkerbell, being a sort of otherworldly guide who is level-headed and all-knowing, a far cry from the emotional creature described by J.M. Barry. Considering the series is supposed to lead directly into the events in the play, I'm not really sure why they went in this mature direction for Tinkerbell, especially since her relationship with Peter comes across more like a teacher and a student than actual friends. I also don't think that it's properly explained why Tinkerbell was willing to sacrifice her entire life for Peter. Like one second she sees him playing a flute, and then the next she's risking the safety of her entire community to keep him alive. Make it make sense. If you're unfamiliar with Once Upon a Time, the series followed a bunch of fairy tale characters after they've been cursed, being brought to the real world with no knowledge of their previous lives. The curse is only broken after Emma Swan, the daughter of Snow White and Prince Charming, is reunited with her family. Over the course of seven seasons, the show had several timelines which alternated between the real world and the fantasy realm, a concept which was fun in the beginning, but got plain old confusing as things progressed. Tinkerbell, portrayed by Rose McIver, first appears in the third season of the series. Before the events of the first curse, Tinkerbell worked for the Blue Fairy, but after stealing some pixie dust to help Regina find her true love, she's removed from her position and loses her wings. She eventually winds up in Neverland, where she becomes one of Peter Pan's trusted allies, although we don't really know how this happens. When the main characters travel to Neverland to defeat Pan, who has become an evil villain, Tinkerbell attacks Regina for making her lose her fairy status. It becomes apparent that Tinkerbell's lack of magical power is because she doesn't believe in herself, but during a fight against Pan, she's able to use pixie dust again, and after all the good she's done, she's given back her fairy status. After that, she doesn't really appear all that much, but at least her story had a solid conclusion, which is more than you could say about some other Once Upon a Time characters. Because the show follows the character over a large period of time, this version of Tink has the greatest evolution by far. Over the course of the series, she's consistently hot-headed and rebellious, which fits with her original characterization, but there's a clear difference in her personality as the years pass. She starts off as naive but well-intentioned, before becoming jaded and vengeful, and ending as courageous and confident. I like that even though Peter Pan is still very much a character, Tinkerbell is allowed to stand on her own and have her own storyline. Plus, I like that some of her more negative behaviors, which might have previously been seen as nothing more than petty, can be somewhat justified. Like most of the characters on the show, Tinkerbell's appearance takes a lot of notes from her Disney counterpart, and I like all the different iterations of the iconic green look that we wind up seeing, even the ones that aren't even green. And I really like the curls. It adds a playfulness that I'm surprised hasn't been employed in her design before. If you had no idea that Tinkerbell made an appearance in the Winx universe, don't worry, you're not alone. In 2016's World of Winx, a spin-off of the iconic animated series Winx Club, the original group of girls are working undercover as talent scouts for a reality TV show on Earth. 
Simultaneously, an evil villain known as the Talent Thief is kidnapping people, and the girls set out to stop them while hiding their fairy identities. It's a strange premise, I know. At the end of the first season, the girls discover that the evil Queen of Neverland was behind all of these abductions, stealing the talents to use for herself, and a battle ensues, which the Winx win. In the second season, they learn that the Queen is actually Tinkerbell, who was once kind-hearted and peaceful, but at some point she fell in love with Peter Pan, who didn't reciprocate her feelings, and he eventually left Neverland to grow up. This heartbreak left her incredibly bitter and angry, with these negative emotions corrupting her magic, and she later turned Neverland into a world of darkness and dreams. The Winx girls team up with Jim, aka Captain Hook, to fight the Queen, only for Jim to betray them all in an attempt to destroy Neverland. Finally seeing the light, Tinkerbell reverts back to her pure fairy form, and fights alongside the Winx Club to stop Jim and restore Neverland to its former glory. Although there have been a few human-sized Tinkerbells, I'm still more accustomed to her being tiny, so having her be the same size as the rest of the characters is jarring to say the least. But considering all of the members of Winx are also fairies, it makes sense in their universe. In her dark form, Tinkerbell is giving goth, and interestingly, is even sporting a dress that is reminiscent of her Disney counterparts. In her light form, she's more regal and generically princessy, wearing a white dress with green accents that is super 2010s. I do think that having Tinkerbell be a legit villain is a unique direction to go in, and I actually find it pretty interesting that they had Peter Pan's rejection serve as a catalyst for her corruption. I just wish the other aspects of her storyline and personality were less obvious. Quietly released direct-to-streaming in 2023, Peter Pan and Wendy follows in the footsteps of Disney's other live-action remakes by modernizing the story to make the female characters more active participants. This isn't necessarily a new idea. With 2002's Return to Neverland and 2003's Peter Pan, both having sword-wielding female characters. But in this film, all of the female characters, from Wendy to Tiger Lily to Tinkerbell, have multiple heroic moments, no longer exclusively being saved by Peter or vice versa. Although the film begins the same way as the animated one, with Tink meeting the darlings in London, she isn't outright mean to them and is instead annoyed that they're treating her like a bug. In the film, neither Wendy or Tinkerbell are shown to have romantic feelings for Peter, and as a result, they don't really spend their time fighting over him, with Tink getting on good enough terms with Wendy that she teaches her how to fly within minutes. Because the character isn't overprotective of Peter, she doesn't do any of her usual sabotaging. And even when Wendy punches Peter, Tinkerbell doesn't react in a manner other than shock. The OG Tinkerbell would have done way more than pull Wendy's hair if that had happened. Because Tinkerbell isn't as attached to Peter and doesn't harbor any ill intent towards Wendy, her character doesn't really do much for the rest of the film. She doesn't betray them to Captain Hook, because there's no reason for her to, and she doesn't sacrifice herself for Peter, because there's no opportunity to. The only thing of note that she really winds up doing is freeing the Lost Boys and helping them defeat the pirates at the very end of the movie. While Tinkerbell is often diminished to nothing more than Peter's crazy sidekick, she's incredibly important to the story itself as she's a metaphor for faith and trust, not to mention that her loyalty to Peter is one of her redeeming qualities, even if it manifests itself in negative ways. Despite spending all of their time together, this version of Peter and Tinkerbell seem like mere acquaintances, which makes her kind of unnecessary to the story apart from her pixie dust. Overall, I just find this Tinkerbell to be kind of bland. She's by no means annoying like some of the other iterations, but she isn't interesting either. I think this has a lot to do with Disney being afraid to give the character any negative qualities, when that's part of what makes her so beloved to begin with. I'm not saying she had to be an exact recreation of her bloodthirsty 1950s counterpart, but why not have her be a little more cold towards the darlings before slowly warming up to them? And while I think Yara Shahidi is gorgeous, I don't think the movie did her justice. Because how has it been 20 years since the last live-action Peter Pan movie, and CGI fairies still look goofy? Not to mention that I found her look as a whole pretty lackluster. I get that they wanted to make it look similar to the original outfit while still being appropriate, but you could have given her a few more accessories. As per usual, there were a good deal of people online who got upset about Tinkerbell being portrayed by a non-white actress, and as per usual, I can't help but roll my eyes at their idiocy. 
I don't really want to get into it here, but if you watch my video about Halle Bailey being cast as Ariel, it touches on many of the same points. But all you need to know is that being black makes absolutely no difference to Tinkerbell's storyline, what little storyline she does have in this movie. Now that we've gone through all 10 versions of Tinkerbell, let's get into the rankings, starting from the worst and ending with the best. This is going to be heavily biased, so don't take it too seriously if your favorite isn't mine. Neverland. I think her character design was supposed to be ethereal, but she just winds up looking creepy. I also think that her level of maturity doesn't really make sense, especially since this is supposed to serve as a prequel. At the very least, they should have wiped her memory as well as Peter's, then at least a change in personality would have been plausible. Peter Pan and Wendy In their attempt to make all of their female characters role models, Disney got rid of any personality Tinkerbell had which was made doubly worse by erasing some of her most iconic moments. She's forgettable at best. Fox's Peter Pan and the Pirates This Tinkerbell is so annoying that I wouldn't bother clapping my hands to bring her back to life. That's how much I dislike her. The only reason she's not at the bottom is that I think her design is kind of cute, and with her added powers, she definitely has an impact on the story. World of Winx I don't think the character herself is that interesting, but I like what they did with her backstory. Plus, her two contrasting designs are just fun to look at. The Adventures of Peter Pan As a more childish version of Disney's Tink, she's by no means amazing, but I appreciate that we actually see her evolve over the course of the series, even if it's only at the very end. Hook I won't deny it, my childhood nostalgia is keeping this from being ranked lower. The character is probably more similar to Peter Pan than she is Tinkerbell, but I still appreciate that she got a bit of backstory and had her own motivations, even if they were a little creepy. And while I hate her main outfit, the dress is giving Cinderella. Once Upon a Time This Tinkerbell has a really great character arc, being way more than just moody and mean, and I really like how they incorporated the believing in fairies aspect. Disney Fairies Franchise with six whole movies, this Tinkerbell had the opportunity for a whole lot of character development. And you know what? They did exactly that. It's a solid origin story that highlights realistic and relatable growth, although I wouldn't have minded if they made her a little more grumpy. My only complaint is that we never got one last movie. Peter Pan I want to make it abundantly clear that if this were just a ranking of the movies, this would be number one, but it's not. So I have to put this Tinkerbell here. I will admit that she is probably the closest to J.M. Barry's description of the character, being hot-headed, emotional, vindictive, and excitable, but I personally would have loved to see them do a little more with her character development if possible. Disney's Tinkerbell I know people will say that I always wind up giving the original movie the top spot, but hey, she's an icon for a reason. There's no denying that Tinkerbell is one of the standouts in the 1953 movie, but I really appreciate that the sequel continued to build on what we knew about her, not erasing her negative attributes, but allowing her to learn and grow from her mistakes, which is a way better lesson than, you can't be mean unless you're the bad guy. Also, let's be honest, this outfit is so cute. Although there's been so many Tinkerbells in the last century, including some I didn't even mention, we're sure to see more of the spunky, pint-sized character in the years to come. There's even a live-action Tink film in development. Which version of Tinkerbell is your favorite? I hope you enjoyed this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll see you soon. Bye!